Welcome to the first lecture of our Fundamentals of Psychedelics lecture series. We will be hosting this series every Thursday evening, uh, this term, up until December. And we are kicking off with our Neuroscience of Psychedelics. So without further ado, I know that everybody's uh, been waiting and apologies for the delay. Uh, we are so delighted uh, to have Manesh joining us from Canada today, uh, aka the psychedelic scientist. Um, please do check him out. Um, please also note that throughout the talk, uh, stick any questions that you have in the chat. I'll be monitoring those uh, and then we can run through at the end. Please also feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, uh, where you're joining from as well. And let us begin. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Sorry for the, the time zone confusion. Uh, seems to always happen somehow. Uh, so I won't uh, take any longer and we'll just dive straight into it. Uh, let's see. And I apologize if some of the animations are messed up because I need to, do, to rush. Uh, um, hopefully you can all see this. I'm going to assume yes. Um, cool. So yeah, in this talk, I'm going to be going over some of the fundamentals of psychedelic neuroscience, as the title says. I'll just be walking through um, some basic background on neuroscience, and then also, and then moving into psychedelics. Um, but this does not apply. So first, I want to say, uh, you know, in this talk, I'll be talking mainly about the so-called classic psychedelics. Uh, which typically is thought to include LSD, psilocybin, DMT slash ayahuasca, and mescaline. Um, some people exclude mescaline, but it is technically a classic psychedelic because it was actually the first one to be widely acknowledged in Western contexts uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, and the thing that brings these different drugs together is that they mainly work on the serotonin system in the brain, and they work in a manner that's very different than other drugs such as MDMA, ketamine, or ibogaine or salvia, for example. So before I dive into the, uh, some more neuroscience stuff and psychedelics, I just wanna walk through uh, an understanding of the brain in terms of different spatial scales. Um, so we could think of the brain in a variety of different ways, right? So one is at the level of a neuron, so just a brain cell. And um, the thing about neurons is that they're grouped in layers. That's why there's these different colors with different numbers. There's Across the cortex, which is the more advanced part of the brain in humans, there are six layers. And um, each layer has a different role in terms of input, output, uh, et cetera, roles in terms of connectivity. And um, so for our, our purposes, we just need to know that, you know, there are something called an individual neuron, which the brain is uh, made up of. There are hundreds of a billion around there, around 100 billion in the brain. And they group into populations. So um, this is a little image of population. Of course, the population in reality is you know, from 100,000 to 500,000 to even a million neurons uh, that are interconnected and thought to play some unified role. Um, and again, these are kind of arranged in layers. So it's not just a sheet, it's there's six layers of them. Um, so that's something to remember, it'll be relevant later. And then if we go up from neural populations then you get to the level of brain regions, which is, um, you could say, a few different neural populations which are grouped together. And, um, and brain regions are defined in a variety of ways, but here is a map defined based on brain imaging fMRI data. And you can see each little, uh, uh, we call them parcels. So every parcel here, the way it's broken down into small pieces, I believe there's something around 400 regions here, differentiated based on the fact that a given region, in a given region, the neuron, the neuron populations in there are more connected to each other um, than the rest of the brain. And then if you go up to another level, then you get your brain networks. So here, um, for example, in red is everyone's favorite, the default mode network, um, which is, a, and brain networks are just groups of brain regions which work together uh, more often than not to perform shared functions. And so the default mode network in this red color and then visual in purple, then you get what's called the frontal parietal control network in orange uh, and so on. And so you could think of the brain as going from neurons to populations, to regions, to networks. Uh, of course, there's other things in here, but this is enough for our understanding today. Um, 
And so, as I mentioned, the brain is composed of around 100 billion uh, neurons. And the thing is, these neurons don't physically touch. They communicate via chemical signals called neurotransmitters at what are called synapses. And um, so here you could see there's two neurons and uh, they connect. So the axon of one neuron attaches to the dendrites, which is the receiving part of the other neuron. And um, they affect each other through these junctions called synapses. So, so again, these are not touching each other. They're coming very, very close at the level of nanometers. And um, the what we call the presynaptic neuron, the neuron delivering the, the information or the neural impulse, releases neurotransmitters into this junction. And then depending on what receptors this other neuron has, uh, it'll activate or modulate its firing. So these little things are the receptors, which are little membrane proteins. And so this one, let's say this region, uh, this neuron got activated and now it's releasing uh, these neurotransmitter molecules and they attach onto the other receptor, uh, other uh, neurons receptors. And the thing is, uh, a given neurotransmitter can only affect a neuron if that neuron has receptors for it. So every neuron doesn't have receptors for every neurotransmitter. And so one way to think about it is that neurotransmitters are kind of like keys and the receptor is a lock. Um, you know, in this case, neurotransmitter B won't fit into this uh, neuron, let's say, or this receptor, uh, because it doesn't fit. And so there's a selectivity where a given receptors are needed in order for a neuron to be influenced by neurotransmitters. And um, so something to say at the beginning is that psychedelic drugs, such as the ones I mentioned, do not directly release neurotransmitters, but they actually act as if they are neurotransmitters at certain receptors. Um, and in particular, with um, the class of psychedelics, it's the serotonin 2A receptor that seems to be most important. So they act as if they're serotonin at, these, at this particular serotonin receptor to elicit their main effects. Um, but stepping back a bit, what are all the receptors that these classic psychedelics, CPs, I abbreviated here, uh, what do they hit? So actually a lot more than just the serotonin 2A receptor. So 5-HT is... Um, I guess shorthand for serotonin, it stands for 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is the chemical name of serotonin. And so you get the 5-HT1A, 2B, 2A, 2B, 2C, 5, 6, 7. So it hits a lot of different receptors. Um, an exception here is that mescaline doesn't really hit the 1A, which is actually an important property of it. Um, I should mention here that 1A and 2A are the most abundant uh, serotonin neurotransmitters, uh, sorry, receptors in the brain. And then... Um, overall, these classic psychedelics don't really hit dopamine very much at all, uh, with the exception of LSD, which actually hits a number of dopamine receptors, the D1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, the other ones have pretty low uh, affinity, uh, and, and, and even that, it's limited to the D3. So overall, dopamine doesn't really play a central role in psychedelic effects, and it's unclear. We don't really know what these dopamine receptors are doing in terms of LSD. And then you also activate... Um, what's called the alpha adrenergic receptors and then also dmt uniquely activates this other receptor called the sigma one receptor and and so but at the, at the end of the day at the end of the day is recept uh studies have shown that the serotonin 2a the 5-ht2a is most important for psychedelic effects for all these drugs because if you specifically block it then you block uh, people don't have this experience you could take all the lsd you want and you won't trip and so let's talk more about this receptor then. So the serotonin 2A receptor, uh, as I mentioned, responsible for psychedelic uh, effects of these drugs. And the thing about it is it's predominantly expressed in a particular type of neuron. Um, so all neurons are the same. There's a whole variety of types of neurons. And so this one uh, neuron that uh, serotonin 2A receptor seems to be on the most is uh, are what are called layer 5 pyramidal neurons. And these are actually some of the most complex uh, cells and are really important in terms of integrating information. Um, so here, these are examples of what they would look like and, and they kind of span across the different layers and take inputs from each of the distinct layers and integrate them together. So they're, they're these kind of more complex information integration neurons in the brain. Um, and uh, they also are called projection neurons. Uh, in that they project long distances and mediate communication uh, in distant parts of the brain. So 
they integrate and then project. So you can imagine they're very important for overall functioning in the brain um, and integrating information. And the thing about this, uh, uh, well, actually, to, to move on from that, it affects these types of neurons. But then, you know, where in the brain does it affect these types of neurons the most? Um, so it, it seems to be the case that um, it affects them the most in what's called association cortex. Um, so it's shown in red here. So psychedelics mainly hit layer five pyramidal neurons, which are mainly located, uh, it hits D pyramidal neurons that are mostly located in these regions in red here. And if you know any brain anatomy, these are higher, highly overlapping with the default mode network. And they're actually, um, this part of cortex, part of the brain is called association cortex because it's involved in associating and integrating diverse uh, inputs. Um, rather than encoding sensory processing, like just our sense of um, touch or just our sense of vision, it's taking information from the sensory um, and the vision areas and bringing them together and integrating them. Um, so they're in the more advanced parts of the brain that are involved in these more associative processes. And so um, you could see from all this, like why psychedelics affect the entire brain and experience in such a dramatic way. They're really just targeting some of the most integrative and critical areas of the brain for its overall functioning. And, well, yeah, and uh, so, so let's say, okay, so they activate these receptors at these locations, but what happens to the neurons when it becomes activated? How does the activity of these layer five pyramidal neurons change? And uh, the thing is, as I mentioned, well, I guess I didn't mention this, but <laughs> uh, serotonin T receptor activation actually has an indirect effect on neuron activity. It doesn't make the pyramidal cells more or less likely to fire directly, but it modulates other neurotransmitters, which then make neurons more or less likely to fire. In particular, it modulates what's called glutamate and GABA, which are two of the main neurotransmitters in the brain. We see in this little image I pulled off of Google, uh, glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, which means it mediates, um, it's what allows neurons to make other neurons more likely to fire. So it excites them, it's excitatory. Um, it's also very important for a neuroplasticity in terms of synaptogenesis, neurogenesis, et cetera. Um, and then in contrast, GABA is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter, mean, meaning it makes neurons less likely to fire. And anti-anxiety and anti-convulsant drugs use GABA. Also, you drink alcohol, it's mediated through GABA, uh, the GABA receptor. And um, so the brain is always kind of regulating its balance between being hyper excitable and then hyper inhibited and you know depressed in this activity. Um, and so two-way activation modulates the release of both these neurotransmitters. And, um, but when everything's said, is said and done, the net effect that this has is it increases extracellular glutamate levels. Um, and it does this through what we call these diffuse volume transmission effects. So what does this mean? So usually when one neuron is affecting another neuron, it releases neurotransmitters, as we saw in that picture before, and affects just that target neuron, neuron. Those neurotransmitters stay in that synapse and only involve those two neurons. However, when uh, these neurons are activated, when the serotonin 2A receptors activate on these neurons, glutamate uh, actually spills out and affects a whole bunch of neurons in the vicinity. And this is called volume transmission, meaning it just moves through the volume of extracellular space and uh, comes out there and affects a whole bunch of neurons. And uh, if you remember, glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So what does this do? It makes neuron populations more excitable and makes them more sensitive to being fired and more sensitive to inputs. And also, since this is happening in this diffuse way where all these neuron populations are starting to fire a lot more, it actually becomes a bit irregular or entropic where now the activity of these different neurons are less predictable. So it's kind of disorganizing the activity and making them all a bit crazy and hyper, hyperactive, but not in sync with each other. Um, this is kind of what I say here is they're desynchronized. So you're getting this diffuse increase and desynchronization of uh, neuron populations. As you, can mention, uh, as you can imagine, this is just disrupting what's normally going on there and whatever 
uh, you know, information is being encoded usually is being very disrupted uh, by this whole process. And one interesting kind of speculation here is, um, you know, as, a, as I've been saying, the neurons are becoming more excitable. They're more sensitive to being fired. And an interesting speculation is to link that to this concept that psychedelics are these non-specific amplifiers of unconscious activity or cognitive processes, which is proposed by Stanislav Grof. Uh, back in the in the seventies, I believe, <clears throat> and it's just making our brain more sensitive overall, and which yeah, again lines up with a lot of people's experiences, I think. And um, so that's what it does to like kind of neuron activity at the level of neurons and populations of neurons. Um, and another thing it does is that uh, actually the two A receptor boosts neuroplasticity, again through glutamate processes, because glutamate is essential for regulating neuroplasticity in the brain. Um, and in particular, uh, two-way activation can lead to increase synaptogenesis, so in the creation of new synapses, spinogenesis, uh, the creation of new uh, spines. And what that means is on a receiving neuron, on the dendrites, which receive inputs from other neurons, it can only make synapses where there's what's called dendritic spines. So you could think of a spine as a landing uh, a landing spot for another neuron to come and affect that neuron. So it's creating more landing spots on the receiving neuron. Um, and then neurogenesis, that this, will, this more so refers to development when um, it, it makes kind of brain stem cells more likely to turn into neurons. Um, and of course, lots of thoughts can come up in relation to Stone Age uh, theory in relation to that. And we could talk about that after in the Q and A. Um, and it does these things, again, through what's essentially mediated by glutamate activity, um, which then leads to changes in gene expression and uh, in the presence of certain proteins like, such as brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and also just modulating different intracellular signaling pathways that you know, lead these neurons to change in their shape and size and you know, grow spines and all the rest. And something that's been found also related to this in mice is that um, psychedelics help them unlearn fears. So we call this fear, uh, fear memory extinction or extinction memory. Um, and so this is, again, suggesting greater neuroplasticity and flexibility in uh, habits or learning, essentially. However, this has really been only shown in mice and in vitro, so in, in neurons in a little dish. Um, for, given like difficulties around, you know, methodological difficulties, uh, this hasn't been shown directly in humans because uh, we have to do it quite indirectly in humans because we can't really open up, you know, the brain and look at dendritic spines or or whatever at these very very fine scale things. Um, but there are there is ongoing research at ICL actually, uh, I think led by David Erzo and others, uh, finding looking to find indirect measures of plasticity that you can look at in humans, which might be able to allow us to bring these mice findings mouse findings into humans. And yeah, so that's what I wanted to bring back and talk about the brain scale. So, you know, we saw neurons, uh, you know, make some excitable as well as at the population level. Uh, and at the neuron level, make some grow dendritic spines, which occur on these little parts here. Um, and now let's talk about brain regions. So, you know, you get these neuron level changes in terms of neuroplasticity, making new connections, uh, more chances for synapses to grow. And then neurons are also becoming hyper excitable and entropic and desynchronized. So then when you scale up and look at a level of a brain region, which again is composed of something on the order of like a million to maybe even like hundreds of millions of um, neurons, you know, what's happening there? And then we'll get to the networks as well. So the best look, uh, perhaps the best look we have at uh, neuro brain region level desynchronization is using what's called MEG, which is a, a technique that essentially uses magnetic signals uh, in order to index brain activity. And you're able to see at a very fine temporal scale, so on the order of milliseconds, how are um, populations of neurons firing in sync with each other. And, um, and the thing is they, they, they fire in sync with each other at, at different frequencies. Some will fire in sync at you know one to four cycles per second. Some will do it to eight to fifteen. Some will do it even faster at thirty to fifty in the gamma frequency band. 
And so at different rates, um, neurons are syncing with each other to some degree. And this is what you call brain waves or brain rhythms. And uh, one way of measuring this is through a oscillatory power, basically the power of the oscillation in a given frequency, which basically gives an index of how synchronized neurons are with respect to that given frequency. Remember, a frequency can be one to five times a second, one to 10, I'm uh, sorry, five to 10, uh, 10 to 20, et cetera. And in general, if there's high power in a given frequency, it means that there's more neurons firing in synchrony at that frequency. And so what happens when you give somebody a psychedelic and you look at their brain waves? So um, this first picture is with psilocybin. And um, these are different frequency bands, right, at different uh, hertz. So hertz is cycles per second. And you see, um, if you look on this little color axis thing here, increases would be in yellow and red, and decreases would be in purple. As you can see, there's no yellow or red here. It's all very purple, especially uh, in the alpha band. So this is, again, this is showing that overall, the synchronization of neurons in these different frequency bands are, are trending towards being decreased, uh, especially in alpha and beta. Something I can say now is that these alpha changes are actually correlated with ego dissolution pretty strongly in this data set. Um, so this is to suggest that this desynchronization, particularly in this part of the brain, in the so-called posterior cingulate cortex might be related to the, sense, the experience of ego dissolution. So this is with psilocybin, and this one is with LSD. Now the effects aren't as dramatic, but you can also see uh, everything here is blue. There's nothing red uh, that's significant. There's, there seems to be a little bit red here, but uh, it didn't come out as significant in the contrast. Uh, and again, in alpha, you see these changes in this kind of posterior cingulate slash pecunious area uh, which is related to ego dissolution. And so again, you know, these two MEG findings with LSD and psilocybin are showing um, at the brain region level how there's desynchronization across all the frequency bands, it seems. So then what does this mean at the level of brain networks? So now you're getting this, this, this kind of uh, desynchronization at the level of regions, but then how about when we look at how these, all these regions are connecting with each other? And so as you probably know, uh, the overall thing found in psychedelic studies to date is that networks become less integrated within themselves and more integrated between each other. So this is to say that the overall, the brain becomes less modular and less integrated. There's kind of a blurring of functional boundaries where the areas processing vision are less distinct from the default mode network, are also less distinct from areas where you sense of touch, uh, and so on. And so you get this increased integration in the brain, uh, which again, it, it kind of follows in line with this whole disorganization, desynchronization process, because it's blurring the usual kind of constrained and typical patterns of connectivity and activity and kind of overwhelming it with this kind of entropy and desynchronization. And just to show you some figures, um, so what this is, is all these different squares are uh, in relation to the connections between two different networks. And you see they're basically all red with asterisks uh, showing that there is significant increases. So there's a few significant decreases only mostly involving this only in this network, but the rest of the brain is showing increases off the diagonal, which suggests that networks are becoming more interconnected. So this is with psilocybin. Here's one with LSD. Again, in this one, green is showing more interconnections and it's predominantly green. It's only green in terms of significant ones. And then um, this is the ICL LC data set. Uh, again, the significant ones are almost all red, um, showing increased connectivity. And then you get this, everyone's favorite you know, image you see in the media, uh, showing all these connections. And an important thing about this image is that the connections are long range. Uh, for example, a short range connection would be just green to green or blue to blue. Um, you don't really see much of those increase. What you're seeing is green to red, um, just purple to dark blue, yellow to red. And these suggest connections across networks because each color is a different network. So it's not necessarily that networks, well, it's not that networks are becoming more integrated within themselves. It's that they're becoming more integrated with other networks. And this is again shown here.
And something that's in most uh, data sets, and by most, I mean mainly the ones collected at ICL with psilocybin, uh, LSD, and DMT, uh, this pattern seems to be particularly driven by association cortex. So if you remember, association cortex is the more advanced part of the brain that integrates different senses, uh, sensory information, and so on at a very high level in the brain. And these regions also have the highest density of serotonin 2A receptors. And um, it seems that these regions show the most increases in connectivity to the rest of the brain. So uh, to link that, you know, so here we're getting uh, networks are becoming more integrated with each other. But then this seems to be uh, likely be driven by the fact that these regions of the brain, which are usually responsible for integration, are now integrating to a much greater degree. So these uh, particular uh, association network regions are po possibly what are driving the whole brain to become more interconnected. And it all it checks out if you go back down the, the hierarchy to the level of neuron populations. And then you also get, so this is in terms of the number of connections that are between regions and how connected they are. But then the brain is of course very dynamic. It's always changing in time. And so how can we understand how psychedelics affect the complexity or diversity or entropy of brain dynamics? So big surprise, uh, activity and connectivity dynamics become more complex, diverse, unpredictable, and tropic, however you want to say it. Although there is some nuance because there are particular measures that apply to each of these, these adjectives here. Um, and, and so uh, how is this shown exactly in terms of the data? So one is in terms of increased time series entropy. What this means is how entropic the activity of a particular brain region is over time. And what entropy means, we can understand it in this context, is just being unpredictable. Like if you looked at, you know, um, let's say a brain region is active over 10 seconds. Uh, the question is, if we looked at seconds, let's say one to five, can we predict seconds five to 10? And um, the extent to which you can do that is, you know, inversely related to entropy. So if you can't predict five to 10 based on one to five, or it's very hard to predict five to 10, then we could say that time series is more entropic. And so, you know, uh, the study with LSD found that a big part of the brain overlapping with association cortex, but also visual cortex became more entropic in its activity. It's more unpredictable over time. And notably, there were no decreases. So nowhere became less unpredictable. And so this is at the level of, of, of a region's activity, but then also at the level of connectivity between regions, how we just interact with each other. A lot of evidence that suggesting that the brain becomes more complex and enters into a greater uh, set of uh, brain states. In a very toy kind of model of showing this, um, let's look at this top one first. So there's four regions here, left hippocampus, right hippocampus, left anterior singlet cortex, right anterior singlet cortex. And these lines show different ways they can connect. So this top one is placebo. And you can see these can connect, these connect, and so on. And they found that with psilocybin, there are all sorts of new connectivity patterns emerging, ways that they're interacting that they just weren't interacting with uh, placebo. And this is kind of a, a kind of framework that we can understand what it means to have a greater diversity of brain states. There are just more configurations that different brain networks are coming into, or brain regions and networks. And um, there's also this cool paper that came out more recently uh, showing how the brain is more flexible in transitioning between states. So how we can visualize this is that if you think of each state as this, let's say you're rolling a ball on a plane uh, and you know whether it falls into one of these um, troughs or, or valleys uh, depend and how long it stays in there depends how deep it is, right? So if there's like very deep holes and the ball falls, it's gonna take a lot of energy going up the sides and maybe you'll finally get out. And then so you could say the depth of these basins or troughs or, or valleys or whatever you wanna call them uh, represents a brain state and how deep it is represents um, kind of how much you can get stuck in it. And then, you know, how steep you have to move to get out of it uh, is proportional to the amount of energy it takes to get there. And this study basically, you know, through some very complicated but very cool analyses, uh, 
found that LSD seems to flatten this landscape so that it's easier to go in and out of different states. And you can see how this relates to flexibility and diversity and brain dynamics. Now we're able to hop state to state and access all sorts of states that usually we don't get to because we're getting stuck in the states that are deeper or, or more sticky or like pull us in. Um, and this is also shown in this matrix where each one, uh, each one of these is a different brain state. And this is representing the transition energy. So how much energy is needed to transition between these states? And again, if you look at these values are all, it goes from negative four to negative eight. So there's nothing positive. So it's all decreases showing that in LSD, there's reduced energy needed to, to transition between these states, which again is consistent with this whole idea here as is visually shown. So overall, yeah, so the brain in terms of its dynamics over time is just becoming a bit more complex and diverse and transitioning into all sorts of states that usually we're not entering into. So a little summary side, uh, slide. So via serotonin two-way activation, psychedelics uh, make regions in association cortex hyper-excitable and desynchronized. And again, this is through modulating glutamate release in layer five pyramidal cells. And so this, again, makes them very excitable, very sensitive to being fired by inputs and then also desynchronized in relation to each other. If you take that up a level, um, this translate to a, translates to a blurring of regular functional boundaries, which are encoded by the usual synchronized activity. And this leads the brain to just become more interconnected. There's less, uh, there's less structure in terms of differentiating different areas and networks, and everything's becoming a bit more blurred and sharing more information. And then since everything is more interconnected now, there's, you can see how now there's a greater uh, set of possible configurations of connections that you can enter into. And, um, and over time, this leads to a, complex, a greater complexity of brain dynamics, where it configures into this state and then this state and this state uh, in a way that's much more loose and flexible and relatively unconstrained. And you know, somehow all of this translates into the different aspects of our crazy psychedelic experiences. Um, and I should say, you know, this model that I've said here, uh, there's a lot of details that need to be filled in, a lot of uncertainties, uh, a number of conflicting findings, uh, and a lot of detail I didn't go into here. So although this seems to be a very intuitive, uh, you know, and um, you know, reasonable way that things might be working. There's a lot more to it, and we really are in our early stages of learning about these things. But I think this is a good and compelling story, uh, given the research to date. Uh, but more research is needed. And so something I also want to share and talk about, because you guys probably are very interested, is an overarching theory is bringing this together. So the one uh, proposed by Robin uh, Carhart-Harris, which I'm sure you all are aware of, um, is his entropic brain theory. And he originally um, uh, published this back in 2014. And basically um, it hinges on this idea between primary process and secondary process thinking, which comes from psychodynamic conceptions of the mind from Sigmund Freud. Basically primary, let's start with secondary. Secondary process thinking is thinking that's rational and reasonable and it's based on reality. It's kind of our, our mature, you know, human cognitive uh, way of approaching the world. Things have to make sense. Everything's logical. Uh, one plus one equals two. Uh, it's structured, orderly, stable, uh, our usual way of perceiving the world. And then primary process is a, you could think of it as an evolutionarily prior or developmentally prior mode of thinking where um, kind of there's less structure, it's more disorganized, um, you know, one plus one can equal three <laughs> and things aren't logically coherent and consistent. Um, you know, uh, people who are in early psychosis have this kind of uh, mental state where things just don't make sense and there's no rational uh, kind of structure to their thinking. And also thinking gets very visual and imagistic in character. Um, rather than necessarily being highly verbal and structured in terms of, you know, reasonable syntax and, and sentence structure, 
Uh, it gets very vivid where images are, are merging with each other and sharing concepts and, um, and everything is being a bit more blurred together. And um, this thinking, this type of thinking might be also conducive for creativity, thinking of novel solutions to things, thinking out of the box, uh, but also leads to magical thinking, thinking like finding patterns that aren't there, finding associations between things uh, that aren't really associated, et cetera. And, um, and the thought here is that primary process thinking is more of an entropic mode of thought um, because it's more, there's more uncertainty is the way to put it, because when you're in secondary process, your kind of models or understanding of the world and rational thinking is reducing the amount of certainty because now you're able to know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, you know, this wall isn't just going to give in all of a sudden, you know, water is wet. Um, and given that you have this rational reasoning, thinking mind, uh, the world is less um, scary in a sense, it's less uncertain. You're going to be surprised less. And one way to understand secondary process thinking, therefore, is as uh, through entropy suppression. You're suppressing the entropy and uh, crazy unpredictability, uh, unpredictability and complexity of reality um, in order to be able to function in a certain and grounded way. So secondary process thinking is only available when entropy is suppressed. And primary process thinking is happen, happens when that suppression is relaxed and now things are a bit more unconstrained uh, and entropic. Uh, this is kind of what, and as you might guess, the theory is that psychedelics through these disorganized, disorganizing and desynchronizing effects on the brain uh, put it in a more entropic state that lends itself to more of this primary process type phenomena, which again, blurring of images, you know, uh, lack of logical coherence, uh, magical thinking, uh, creativity, et cetera. And um, so, yeah, so that, that's the main gist of what Robin posed in this model. And um, he actually takes it a bit further in terms of the brain and says the default mode network, which is a particular network in the brain, we could talk about in a QA. and I'm not sure how familiar you are with it, um, is what is suppressing the entropy of these more primitive parts of the brain. Uh, because the default mode network, you can actually say, you know what, you could say association cortex because default mode network is highly overlapping with association cortex. So you could say these more advanced, integrative, high level parts of the brain are suppressing the entropy of lower level ones and giving them a sort of structure and order. So that's entropic brain theory in, in a nutshell. And uh, Robin actually built on that with this new model, uh, which is consistent and expands upon this first one. Uh, he released this, I think, in 2019 called Rebus and the Anarchic Brain. Most of you have probably heard of it. Rebus stands for Relaxed Beliefs Under Psychedelics. And, and this, similar to the entropic brain, um, is kind of proposing that our experience of reality is mediated by our models or beliefs or assumptions of the world, how it works, of who we are, and these constrain and filter what we experience, AKA they reduce the entropy of life uh, in order to make it stable and orderly. And, but this is making a specific uh, claim uh, based on the idea that we have these, a brain encodes these high level models, which are constraining these low, our low level experience of the world. And the idea is that by, again, inducing this entropic desynchronized activity, psychedelics are making these high level models uh, less rigid. And an important part, thing, uh, important part of this is that these high level models are thought to be encoded by association cortex slash the default mode network. So if you recall what I've been saying before, these areas in association cortex have the most two-way receptors, um, become the most desynchronized, and become the most interconnected with the rest of the brain. So it's interesting that these high level regions, which are involved in our processes of memory, of making sense of our world, of our sense of self, um, of thinking about the beliefs of other people, that these complex regions are becoming seemingly the most altered under a psychedelic. And it fits with this because by making those regions altered, you're making the beliefs and assumptions and knowledge that uh, they encode less rigid. And this makes our experience more malleable, malleable, unconstrained, and flexible. And the idea is that 
by making our models and our frameworks for who we are and how the world is uh, less rigid and more open to being changed, um, this allows us to, gives us an opportunity to revise these models or beliefs or assumptions in a healthier way. It also opens us up to more information because usually if we have certainty about this or feel like we have certainty about this, that blocks us from seeing things as they actually are. We might, for example, to put it in a kind of more clinically relevant way, let's say somebody had some trauma growing up and they internalize the belief that you know, um, they don't deserve success or they're not worthy of success. Then, you know, as they grow up, uh, they're going to close themselves off to things that prove that otherwise. Uh, you know, something will happen that's showing that they can achieve the success, then they'll attribute to the external world. They won't take ownership of it. Um, they'll, you know, deny themselves opportunities because they believe they don't deserve it. Um, and you could see how if you're in a psychedelic state and now this belief that you've had is less rigid and more malleable, we're able to see the world and reinterpret our experiences, our memories in a new way uh, to then update that belief or model. So that's essentially in a nutshell what the Rebus model propose, proposes. And yeah, as I mentioned, it does this, uh, you know, it's proposed to do this by altering the activity in association cortex and leaf and more network such that its suppression uh, and modulation of lower level areas um, is decreased. And this cool little abstract image here, what does it mean? Uh, so on the top, these area here are, are core regions in the default mode network. And this large arrow going down to this area uh, in the medial temporal lobe involved in memory is suggesting that our models or assumptions send down top down projections and decrease uh, the flexibility of our beliefs and our access to our memories. And so our memories and our experiences have less space to come up and influence our beliefs. And this is shown here as showing a rigid belief structure where new inputs come in and just can't get through because our models and our beliefs are so strong. In the psychedelic state, the thought is you get less of that top down. And now this is liberated or free to send us information and memories we had explained away or we had ignored. And now our whole belief structure has become becomes more uh, malleable, more perturbable. And so, yeah, so that's basically the, uh, the um, understanding of the Rebus model. And yeah, so that's mainly it. I should have had a summary slide, but I missed, messed up the time zones and didn't have a chance to make it. Uh, so, so that's basically, these are two main models proposed by Robin. There are other ones too, uh, but I think these fit with the way I've been framing findings in this talk. Um, and then, yeah, additional resources, if you want to learn more about psych psychedelic neuroscience, a really great place is psychedelicreview.com. A lot of great stuff on there. And of course, shameless plug, <laughs> my YouTube channel is also a way where I share, you know, the scientific research uh, with the broader community and I put it in a layperson friendly way, but that's way a way that's still in detail like I did today and not uh, super superficial, like a lot of media treatments. And with that, uh, thanks for your attention. And that's it for me. Thank you so very much. Um, we have had uh, one comment come through already. Um, mm -hmm. So this is from Hamza. And Hamza says, destroying fear memory can be harmful, though. For example, if we are exposed to something harmful in the past, the fear will remind us of the potential harm and allow us to avoid it. Or have I misunderstood? Yeah, it, no, for sure. No, you're right. But uh, actually what they do in these studies is they first expose a mouse. Let's say, let's say you put a mouse in a little room and whenever they're in there, it shocks them. It shocks them every three minutes. And then soon they'll go in there and they'll start to freak out, obviously, because they're going to get shocked. Um, but then even if you turn the shocks off, they'll still go in there and get scared and take a long time to now learn that it's not, um, it's not dangerous anymore. So when I say it enhances fear uh, extinction learning, uh, or fear learning extinction, <laughs> whatever it is, but it means that when they go in this place that's no longer dangerous, that used to be, they're faster in learning that it's no longer dangerous. So they're faster in unlearning these kind of fear responses which are no longer relevant or adaptive. So it's not that they, they forget how dangerous it is and they go and hurt themselves. It's, it's a bit different. 
Thank you. Um, and would you be able to talk a little bit about the research that you're doing? Yeah, for sure. Um, in relation to psychedelics, so I've been collaborating with Robin a lot um, and a few different projects, him and Chris Timmerman, who's also at ICL. Uh, you're looking at their psilocybin, LSD, and DMT data, trying to analyze it in new ways. Because in the past, you know, each, each of these things have been uh, analyzed separately, and I'm trying to find what are common across them, how can we get into understanding in more detail the changes to brain networks um, and also how different types of analyses and processing pipelines change um, the, the results. So, I mean, the short way to say it is I'm looking at commonalities between these three drugs in terms of brain imaging uh, to shed a light on what's common uh, across them and how that relates to people's experiences. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we haven't got any more questions at the moment. So for now, I would just like to thank everybody for joining. Um, it was an absolute pleasure to meet so many of you at Freshers Fair on Tuesday. Um, I think we've got now 90 members already, um, which is fantastic. Um, and it's good to have the society back off and running and now with some regular events going on. And thank you so much again, Manesh, for speaking at our first event. Um, hopefully uh, we can have you back perhaps for our conference um, mm -hmm. in the new year. We, we would love to host you. Um, sure. Awesome. Yeah, no, thank you so much for the invite. I'm always happy to share about this stuff and spread the knowledge. And yeah, definitely keep me, keep me posted about the conference. That sounds cool. Thank you so much.